Let me ask you, are you tired of superficial relationships? Do you long as a believer to be really deeply connected with other Christians? I mean, that inflames your heart and your soul and there's authenticity in life, but you just don't know how? Well, then stick around. Welcome to this January 29th edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. I'm Katie Kennard, and I'll be candid and say the kinds of relationships Chip just described are pretty few and far between. If you think your heart could use just a little jump start when it comes to loving God and loving others, this message is for you. If you have a Bible, Chip's teaching from Acts chapter 2. Two major themes emerge. And the two major themes are very, very simple. Number one, as you read this verse and as you read the book of Acts and church history, you understand we express our love for Christ by expressing our love for his people. You might write that down. Nah, forget writing it down. Just live it. We express our love for Christ by expressing our love for people, his people. They belong. They matter. They're his sons, his daughters. They're our brothers and our sisters. The way I say to God, I love you, is I give my time and my energy and my resources and my emotions as directed by the Holy Spirit living in me to those of you that God has me rub up against so that the Christ in me could express his love to you. That's how I love you. And that's how I love Christ. We express our love for Jesus, not in some ethereal, I love God, I raise my hands when I sing, I write a check now and then. It's about real live relationships. All those things are fine. But 1 John said, if I say I love God and have no love for my brother, I am a liar and the truth isn't in me. These notes I left, or I thought I left, down at the office. And it was like late afternoon Saturday, and who wants to go anywhere by yourself on Saturday? And so I kind of said, hey, would, would anyone ride with me? You know, please, please, pretty please. And I'll buy dinner on the way home if you'll come. You know, I just, I, you know, I don't go down that dark building by myself, and yeah, you know. And, and, uh, and so we got down there, and it had been a pretty interesting day anyway. And when I pulled up, there's a lady sitting on the steps. And I'm thinking, you know, you know, with a toboggan and kind of a funky-looking long coat. And I got out of the car, and I'm thinking, I need to get my notes. And I said, excuse me. And she goes, uh, are you a manager here, or do you work here? And I said, well, I, I work here. And she goes, well, uh, you know, if it's okay, is it okay if I stay here tonight? I said, well, I know in general they kind of frown on that, and this is not exactly the safest neighborhood, but all, all I want is that little alcove. It's getting really, really cold, and, and, and I believe in God, and I've been talking to him. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's been, it's been a pretty wild day, and what I need is a homeless lady right now. I mean, those are my honest-to-goodness from the heart thoughts. Not proud of them, but those were the thoughts. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, could you, could you just stay right here? I've got to pick some stuff up in the office, and can, I'll, I'll get right with you when I get back. And so, you know, I open the key, set off, do, set off the alarm, turn it off, find my office, and of course, I can't find my notes. Mm. And so I'm coming back, and as I'm shuffling things around. Now, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like you would, what am I going to do with this homeless lady? And I've memorized a few verses, but I don't think I even really memorized this one. And the thought came to my mind, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And I said, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? Just love her. So Okay. So I'm thinking, I'm not sure how I'm going to love her, but she's not going to sleep here. One, it's, it's way, way cold, and she's got a thin coat, number one. Number two, I'm afraid what might happen. And number three, you know, the people that keep all the insurance and forms think, there's big liability here, Chip. You better make sure if you knew about this or something, you know. <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do, and I came out, and I kind of looked at Teresa, you know, hand signs, like, hey, what do you know, what do you, what do you think, you know, what do you think we ought to do, you know? And so I, I said to her, I said, you know, you can't stay here, but, you know, I, I, let me figure out a way to put you up in a hotel, and we'll, we'll, we'll get something straightened out. What's your name? Are you ready for this? Gloria. Hmm. And so we got in the car, and she had a couple bags, and she was proud inside. She had an old, a new sleeping bag, and we put them in the trunk, and she sat in the back with Annie, and it was very articulate. 
very articulate. And as we went down, I said, Gloria, are you hungry? She goes, well, no, I couldn't accept anything and this and that. And, and along in the story, you know, we're sitting in a little Mexican restaurant, the four of us, and we had dinner with a homeless lady. And, you know, I, you know, I had one of those days where, you know, your emotions were all over the map. I got to tell you, dinner with the homeless lady and dropping her off at La Quinta and sharing our testimony about what God was doing in our life and... Um, you know, you know that passage where it says, now and then you entertain you know, angels unaware? I don't know if Glory was an angel, but she was an angel from God for me. I, I, I think my attitude did the biggest 180 in a 24-hour period. And I thought, oh, Jesus, what a privilege to express my love to you by just being your hands, nothing big. Well, you know, I wasn't even motivated to do it. It's not like, you know, I was a big super Christian. I mean, I just finally got to where I would obey. And that lady was a delight. And, you know, we figured out this place, and the lady at La Quinta could figure out what's going on and, you know, gave her the special deal for two nights, and we went and took her stuff up to her room. And, you know, the three of us drove home. And you, you know what I learned? I learned we express our love for Christ by expressing our love for his people. And you say, what do you mean his people? She said, I'm a Christian. And she said, you know, I know it's going to get real cold. And I called down to the shelters, and they've just given me the runaround. She said, just before you came up, I just said, God, would you please take care of me today? It's going to be really cold tonight. Would you help me? And I thought, you know what? This lady got a hug, didn't she? She got a hug. She got a hug from an invisible God. And, and, you know, God orchestrates this stuff because I had looked through my briefcase about four times. Where's my notes? Where's my notes? Where's my notes? To anxiety. I'm going to preach tomorrow. I can't find my notes. Oh, I left them on the office. Well, I got news for you. Once we went through all this, I went back up, and they were just right there in my briefcase. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they were right there. So I guess God has a way of making you see what he wants you to see. The second observation out of this passage that is absolutely critical is not only do we express our love for Christ when we express our love for his people, we receive love from Christ when we receive love from God's people. You know, sometimes we think, God, do you love me? God, do you love me? God, do you love me? And someone comes up and says, can I give you a hand? Or how's everything going? Yeah, would you quit it? Don't bother me right now. God, do you love me? God, do you love me? And, you know, then someone calls and says, you know, you know we're going to go do this. Do you want to? No, I'm too depressed. You all go ahead. God, how come you don't love me? And, you know, the way God loves you, he's not going to call you on the phone, probably. Okay. The way God loves you is he's going to bring one of his children into your life, maybe in a way that you like and maybe in a way that you don't like, to express his love to you. And by the way, when we talk about love, you know, you can get real sentimental and real emotional. Love is not ooey-gooey feelings, high-fiving, arm around one another, and having warm emotions. That's nice. I love that. Love is giving other people what they don't deserve caring for them when they don't deserve it, out of obedience to Christ. It's giving people what they need the most, when they deserve it the least, at great personal cost to yourself. That's love. Now, I like it when it's filled with good emotions and high fives and the warm feelings and that sense of kumbaya holding hands in the room. I mean, I love that as much as the next guy. But let's not confuse sentimentality and emotions with love. We receive love from God when his children or believers do and act in ways that are consistent with the Spirit's leading. Now, I, you know, I've been convinced now for many, many years that the way God teaches me to preach is that he usually takes me through the message before I get to give it. Someone asked me, you know, pastors say, hey, where do you get all those illustrations? And, you know, I got a book with 5,000 illustrations. I don't have any books with illustrations. And I don't look at any books with illustrations. i found if I just keep my eyes open, God gives me more each week than I know what to do with. I got loved this week. I didn't get ooey-gooey loved. I got deeply loved. I sat in one of our S Starbucks with uh, a guy in the church here who four different times admonished me about one area. Hey, hey, are you loving? Are you loving? You know, are you loving? You know, Chip, I want to, you know, you know, you got that intensity, the balance between heat and light. I sense there's a little more heat at times than there is light. You know, do you really understand? And you know, like the fourth time I said, you know, I got it, okay? I mean, this message from God, unless he wants you to say that one more time, 
I got it. And I thought about it deeply. And I mean, I went home and did three or four things in response to that. And you know what? When I walked out, I felt closer to that man than I felt to him any time I've ever been with him. Because you know what I've learned? Only the people that really love you tell you the truth. Only the people that really love you are willing to risk the relationship and put everything on the line to help you see something that God wants you to see. And they're, they're humans and they're fallible, so maybe it's only 82% right or 67% right. You know what? Even sometimes if people are down on you, it may be only 12% right. But that 12% is from the Lord. You need to listen. God loves you and God loves me and he expresses it through his people to you and to me. And sometimes it's an arm around the shoulder that's a hug and sometimes it's a, a gentle, caring from the heart rebuke that you need. And sometimes it's a meal and sometimes it's getting help to learn your spiritual gift and sometimes it's helping someone move and sometimes it's a dinner and sometimes it's a phone call and sometimes like this week I got a number of notes that I... I just read them and I just thought, uh, affirmation. Dear Chip, thanks, da, 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 and God used that. I just thought, that's not just stuff. God leads people to write notes. God leads people to make calls. God leads people to take money that is his, that is on loan to them, to give it to love and to care for others. We express our love for Christ by loving each other, and God expresses his love for us by using people in our lives. Let me give you uh, the meaning of biblical fellowship or koinonia. And I, and I alluded to it, but you know, those of you taking notes going, you know, he went too fast. It's to share. It's to have in common. It's to partner. It's an association. It's a communion. A, a togetherness and a bond of the heart that grows out of our bond with Christ. In fact, by way of word picture, it is a group of people so filled and so in love with Jesus by means of the Holy Spirit that they, with reckless abandon, love one another out of every aspect of their lives. See, koinonia fellowship, it's not a good feeling with a nice pot of coffee in a small group. Koinonia can happen there, but there's a lot of small groups. Koinonia doesn't happen. But that's a good environment. It's people who are so filled with the love of God that it spills out into love for one another so that the heart of God through the spirit of God, through the normal hands and arms and shoulders and feet and eyes and time and talent and treasure gets transmitted from one believer to another believer, not because the other person deserves it, but because we belong to one another, because we belong to him. Koinonia, or the fellowship, is a union with Christ that goes so deep that we recognize our union with one another. So we begin, imperfectly of course, but to treat one another exactly the way Jesus would treat us if he happened to be living in our body. And he happens to, doesn't he? That's koinonia. Three characteristics out of this passage of koinonia in terms of by way of application, first, it was for all believers. Verse 46, no distinctions were made, no race, no color, no socioeconomic differences, no different ethnic backgrounds, all the believers. I had the privilege of preaching at an all-black church. It was a three-hour service. And after I get done preaching, usually I'm kind of tired, and if I know I have another one that night, it's like, boy, I need to kind of rest. You know, I drove home the worship was so rich, the fellowship was so rich, the time was so great with God, and I, I saw how different parts of the body of Christ and the differences in the way they did it, and to be candid just with my background, I just really fit in. And it was a lot freer, and no one was in a hurry. And then, you know, the people just lined up for prayer, and the deacons were anointing people with oil, and I felt prompted. I just went, man, I got down on my knees for about 20 minutes and had a great time with God, and, and, and it was just a... Uh, a time with God's people that come from a different culture that was so rich. And I, I dream and long for this passage getting lived out. You know, all believers. It was for all of them. The second characteristic, it held the believers together. 
It promoted unity in the midst of extreme diversity. And notice in this passage, the health of the group was more important than anyone's individual agenda. They had all things in common. And everyone who had need, their needs were met. And then finally, it met the needs of the believers. It wasn't just a gathering. Koinonia is not getting together either in small groups or large groups or medium-sized groups or in a church. It's not just gathering together in the name of Christ. Real needs have to get met. Have you ever been someplace where if there's not needs met, there's not love given or love received? It, it's real. I mean, that's the Spirit of God working in your spirit and your life to move you to think outside yourself, to want to do something for someone else who doesn't have, that's koinonia. It's for all believers. It holds us together, and it meets needs. Why is this so important? Is this just important because, you know, um, I have needs and you have needs? And is this just important because, you know, Jesus is not here anymore, and I need a hug, and you need a hug, and people need a hug? I'm going to suggest that the importance is far beyond my needs and your needs, as important as those are. I'm going to suggest that the impact of koinonia can't be underestimated. I've got two stories I want to read. I've put them in your notes, but you can open your Bible if you want. And I have very little comment, but I want you to think. I want you to think of the, what's the power of the fellowship, the meeting of the needs, the caring, the belonging to one another. And, and right after this text, the Spirit of God places at the end of chapter 4 of Acts this positive story about a man named Barnabas that exemplifies the power of koinonia. And then immediately afterwards, he gives another story that's negative about people who fake koinonia and the huge implications that it has. Listen as I read you a little story. All the believers were with one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. Can you imagine that place? But they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, and they brought the money from the sales. And they, they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed as anyone had need. Do, do you get the picture of what's going on here? I mean, this is radical. This is radical, radical, radical. The Spirit of God is doing something in selfish hearts. They've been transformed. And then in case you want a, a specific picture, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And when you do a little research on Barnabas, you learn that he was from Cyprus. And Cyprus was like downtown Manhattan in terms of real estate. And so he sold a pretty sweet piece of real estate because he thought, you know what, I've got a lot of physical, material resources, and we're birthing this church, and things are really happening, and I think I'm going to exchange some of those financial resources to meet the needs of a lot of people, and he did. Positive example of koinonia. The text goes on. Negative example. Ananias and Sapphira. Now, the text says now, put a line through that. It's, it's an okay translation. It's but. It's but. And that's important because the author wants us to know what you just heard is one thing. Here's the contrast. But a man named Ananias was together with his wife Sapphira, and they also sold a piece of property. In other words, like exhibit A, here's exhibit B. With his wife full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias... How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? And then notice where he's going here. He's, he's saying, hey, it was yours. No one said you had to give it all. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Answer, yes. And after it sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, you could give 8%, 32%, 85%, half of it. And and I, it's your stuff. No one says you got to give this. But notice... And after it was sold, the money was at your disposal. What made you think of doing such a thing? You haven't lied to men, but to God. You understand what he did? He said, I sold it for $10,000. He really sold it for fifteen. dollars kept back five, So that everyone would think he'd given all to Jesus. The sin is not about giving. The sin is not about money. The sin is about hypocrisy. 
The sin is about acting like you love people and making people think you care more than you really care. It's the first sin recorded in the New Testament church. And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, everyone has a few downfalls. I mean, hypocrisy, like how serious could that be? We're all a little bit hypocrite, right? Read on. <laughs> you haven't lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, and they wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. And about three hours later, you know, here we go. The scene changes, the camera changes, the zoom lens go back. Ananias, they watch the guys walking him out. And, you know, I mean, people are going, whoa, for just lying, for being a hypocrite? I mean, it, bang, heart attack. Three hours later, Sapphira comes in. Hey, has my hubby been by? As a matter of fact. So notice the interrogation here. So here we go. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, he gives her a chance, tell me, is this the price that uh, you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, we're so committed. We're so loving. We care so much. You know Barnabas, all the strokes he got and how he became a real hero in the church? We would like to be just like him, having people think that we're wonderful, loving, caring, and sacrificial. Yes, that's exactly the price. I think I'm reading into this just a shade. <laughs> Peter asked her, how could you agree? In other words, you're in cahoots. How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? And then it gets very sober. Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died, and the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You ever wonder why the Spirit of God would place this in the annals of the early church as the first sin recorded? You see, koinonia and hypocrisy can't go together. We are all, we're human, we're fleshly. We spend probably more energy trying to convince ourselves some and other people a lot more that we're loving and caring than we're really loving and caring. Our image and what people think and how we come off in our flesh just becomes so paramount. And see, there can't be real koinonia if the real care doesn't come from a real heart that's really sincere. And so you notice the extent of our impact is directly proportional to the unity and the authenticity of our fellowship. See, real koinonia is about real unity, not phony unity, not we're all together, we all agree on everything, everything's peachy. Real unity is forged out of authentic conflict, and real unity is forged out of a commitment to the truth, and real unity happens when you just flat out care for people when it costs. And the extent of our impact as a body will be directly proportional to the genuine unity and the authenticity of our fellowship. Jesus said it best, a new commandment he gave to his disciples, that you love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. I think God wants to birth a group of people that say, we want genuine koinonia and it begins with me. I want to express my love for God by loving you. I want to receive love from God by having people not only tell me the truth, but put their arm around me. And the extent of our impact will be the genuine unity that we have and the authenticity that we have both before God and before one another. Chip's going to be back to talk more about this specific pathway to intimacy with God. But before he does, let me just say that in this series, you're going to be challenged to move beyond routines to the richness of real relationships with God and with others. Here's the thing, though. We rarely catch the important points just hearing a message once. So if Chip's teaching was helpful, let me encourage you to listen again if you're thinking about making some changes. To check out all the resource options for this series, just tap Special Offers. I'll be right back in just a minute to talk about the specific pathway we address today. But there's a very important reason why this series follows our series on the Invisible War. 
90% of spiritual warfare is defensive. In other words, it's about putting on the belt of truth. It's about having your mind renewed. It's about not having doubts. The way that you put on the armor of God is the disciplines of the Christian life. It's being in the Word. It's learning to pray. It's renewing your mind. This entire series on pathways is to help you fight the invisible war and win. But what we know is there's so many people that don't make the connection between the spiritual disciplines and the battle that you're in every day. And so we have available for absolutely free. If you'll commit to do the small group, the invisible war, we will send you up to 10 copies for your group, absolutely free. There's an insert where you can watch the video. The study guides are there for you. And here's what I know. God will open your eyes and help you to win and win over strongholds and difficulties and issues in your life when you begin to make the connection between it's not about just reading the Bible or praying or being in community. It's doing those things in light of the spiritual warfare that you encounter each and every day. Katie will give you all the information about how you can get your copies. We're very excited about this offer. If you commit to doing this study with at least one other person in the next 60 days, we'll give you the study guides for free. We'll even pay the shipping. And here's why. As you're making plans for the new year, you have an adversary who's determined to deceive and discourage you into inaction. So the timing of this free offer is perfect. We want to equip you to win. Just tap special offers to order your free Bible study of the invisible war. Now here's Chip with a final thought. As we close today's program, I want to remind you that an invisible God makes physical impressions by your hands and your feet. I mean, the way God loves people is through ordinary people like you in whom his spirit dwells. And I just got to tell you that we are absolutely convinced that life change occurs best when people are connected from the heart. When Jesus wanted to change the world, he drew a small band of men who did life together. They didn't just study the truth. They did life together. They met one another's needs. They cared for one another. And so I want to ask you today, just as application, are you connected? Not just do you go to church. I mean, not even do you just, quote, go to a Bible study. Because, you know, you can go to a Bible study and not really let people into your life. Are you connected from the heart? Do you have one or two or three people that you are really doing life with? They know what's going on. And if not, let me encourage you, take that step. I mean, take that step. We have uh, been involved in a church where small groups and this kind of connection was not a big part of its history. And I've had people in their 60s, 70s, and early 80s tell me, you know something? I went to programs. I went to Sunday school classes. I did all kind of things. I served. And I thought, I don't need this small group stuff. And then I heard the guy say, for the last 13 months on Monday nights, I've opened my home. And we have gotten some of those small group DVDs from Living on the Edge, and we've watched it. And he said, I mean, I, I've, I'm biblically literate, but I've never let people in my life. And he just uh, went through a really upside down time in his business. Um, after 35 years of a flourishing business, the last two years have been tough. The bank called the note on his credit line. And he said, I have texts and emails and notes, and I'm being loved, and I've never experienced that before. Who in your world might need you to go to our website and you find a DVD series and, uh, or maybe an MP3 or download some message notes, but you just say, I'm going to ask this person for the next three or four or five weeks, why don't we look or listen to this together and let's share hearts, let's pray together, and I will tell you, God will show up. He wants to love you and he wants to love through you, so go do it. Just before we wrap it up, have you ever been listening and thought to yourself, you know, Chip, I wish we were visiting over a cup of coffee because I'd love to ask you about, and I'm sure you can fill in the blank. Well, your opportunity's here because during the month of February, Chip's going to be in studio every Friday to answer your questions about relationships. Through the month of February, his teaching's all about relationships, moms and kids, what God has to say about how to build great relationships, and how to build a healthy family in a modern world. So every Friday, we're going to pause and give Chip a chance to answer your questions about relationships. To send your question, just email it to chip at livingontheedge.org. 
Well, until next time, this is Katie Kennard saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge.